Well, the Bible says to praise Him with every instrument, so we're going to do that. Christian Assembly has a long history of men and women getting away for weekend retreats. It was a time to get away from the busyness of life in Los Angeles and connect with God and community. We haven't done retreats in a few years. But we are excited to announce that next year in 2024, retreats, retreats are back! back! We will be hosting a women's retreat in March 2024. And a men's retreat in October of 2024. And we'll be spending three days and two nights right here at Forest Home in the beautiful San Bernardino Mountains. The retreats will offer an opportunity to enjoy the beauty of God's creation. Get away to spend time with Jesus, worship with God's people, be encouraged by biblical teaching, and simply to have fun together. We'll share more details in the coming months. But for now, consider yourself officially invited to retreat. Yes, you, we want you there. Mark your calendar for 2024 to join us for women's retreat and men's retreat. We can't wait to be with you. Let's go! Yes! We are excited for retreats to come back to Christian Assembly in 2024. Like we saw in the video, women's retreat will be happening March 8th through 12th, uh, March, March 8th through 10th, 2024. Men's retreat, October 25th through 27th, 
2024. We are excited. I know that feels like a long way away, especially for the guys, but mark your calendars. It's coming. We are so excited. And if you've never, ever been to Forest Home Retreat Center, let me tell you, you are in for a treat. It is a beautiful location where many a generation has gone to encounter the Lord. So we are excited for retreats to come back in 2024. Registration details will be coming soon but we just want to let you know so plan ahead mark your calendars women in march men in october join us for men and women's retreats in 2024 well welcome to each and every one of you my name is marvin and it is it is really truly a pleasure to worship with you some sometimes i just stop singing and i love to hear you all sing in this room it is a powerful experience so thank you for bringing it today thank you for worshiping alongside of me uh just excited to to be with you if you are new or visiting and you just kind of stepped into this place, kind of figuring things out, we are so glad that you are here. We are glad that you are here tonight. We would love for you to make this your home. There is a connection card right in the seat back in front of you. You can grab that connection card, fill that out. Someone on our staff team will call you. We just want to get to know you. There's also a new people's table that's out in the lobby, and uh, you can stop by there for a free gift. And if you are joining us online, I want to say thank you. For being with us, we love that you're with us online. I hope that you are being blessed wherever you are as well. A couple other things I want to mention. Uh, highlights are in your bulletin, on our app, and on our website, so please check those things out. The women are having a women's gathering coming up on Thursday, September 7th. Cue excited women. Right here in this place time of worship, a time of prayer, learn from a panel of trusted women and be encouraged by God's word. So ladies, come on out Thursday, September 7th. And they told me to say this. So if that all that didn't excite you, there will be free churros also as well. So come on out for the worship and the prayer and the churros. <laughs> Thank you, Scotty. <laughs> and men, men's gathering is happening on Wednesday, September 13th. Cue excited, guys. <laughs> That's right, we're having a worship gathering right here on Wednesday night, September 13th. All the men of Christian Assembly will gather in this place and lift up a roar unto the Lord. Mark will be teaching us, guys. Mark will be teaching us. So come on in and listen to Mark. Teach us from God's word on the topic of discipline. It's going to be great. And if all of that wasn't enough, if you come before the men's gathering at 530, we've got a barbecue tailgate party. We're going to have like a smoking truck, smoking food and meat. I, can you tell I'm not a barbecue guy from the places where they do this kind of thing? Matt, is that what it's called? A smoking truck? <laughs> no. A truck that smokes meats. You know that thing. Pulled pork and brisket sandwiches for all of you. So come on out to the men's gathering. Invite a friend to come with you. I know. I'm going to hear about this later. And before we move on in our time of worship, one of the ways that we worship is by giving of our tithes and offerings unto the Lord. We do it, uh, we sing songs, uh, we greet one another, and uh, we offer back to a God who is just so generous in our lives. Romans 15, 13 says, fill you with joy and peace as you trust in him. And one of the ways that we show trust in him is by honoring him by giving our tithes and offerings. And so as we prepare to do that, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for all of the ways that you're encouraging us to be a part of a Christ-centered community, whether it's a retreat, a women's gathering, a men's gathering. We just pray that these are not just announcements, but we would actually be encouraged to lean in, to be with one another, and seek you as we make this our church in our group, Father God. And so we pray for those events that are upcoming, even the retreats next year. We just pray that those will be times where you would meet with us on the mountain with the women and the men of Christian Assembly. Would you bless us now as we worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings? And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, hello, everybody. Glad to be with you. If you're visiting, my name's Matt. Always a pleasure to have you with us. It is a kingdom weekend uh, where we take just a moment to highlight our value of the kingdom of God. When Jesus explained wh what he was all about, what he was accomplishing, he said the time has come, the kingdom of God is near. Turn and trust him and receive that good news of God's kingdom. The kingdom is 
is the will of God, all that God desires for us to receive and experience with him made available through Jesus Christ for you and me. And that's the message at the heart of the local church that we're a part of as Christian Assembly, to make that message known locally and around the world. So our kingdom value uh, is, how, is, is how we make that known Uh, even reaching beyond the walls of this church to other parts of the world. About 20 years ago, there was a couple in our local church who felt compelled to take that message of the kingdom of God to another part of the world. They heard about nations uh, that had very little access to the gospel, very few believers, and particularly the nation of the Czech Republic. Uh, where there, it was the most, at the time, atheistic nation in Eastern Europe. They said, that's where we'll go and bring the gospel. They partnered with Young Life to begin to present the gospel to the youth of that country. Uh, they've been doing that work for 20 years. And I want you to just take a little uh, watch, uh, look at the, the screens to get just a little glimpse of what that ministry looks like. Amazing how youth camp in the Czech Republic <laughs> looks a lot like it does here, doesn't it? We have the pleasure of ha- having Al and Stacy Anderson with us tonight. Would you welcome them up? Al, it's great to have you. Stacy, so glad to have you. And uh, Al and I, we didn't go shopping together for the occasion. It just happened this way. You but, sent me the memo, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, Al, it's so great to have you, Stacy. So glad that you're with us. Um, Al, I know you want to greet the church, and then just give us a little bit, tell us a little more about ministry in Eastern Europe. Thanks. First, I want to say thanks, Marvin, for that video. We met at a CA retreat in 2000 at Forest Home. So, so, so you never know what can happen, right? <laughs> So, um, first of all, I want to say hi from our family. Our kids are across the street right now. Uh, We have a picture of them. They're growing up uh, fifth and sixth grade, and so we're so excited they get to be with us this time uh, with us here at CA. And we're just so excited to be here at CA and just sitting here just thinking, oh, I just um, taking in uh, the worship here is just amazing. like Matt said, we started in Czech Republic, but now we're helping lead Young Life in seven countries. We have a map up there because probably your Eastern European geography isn't that great. Um, and so we're leading Young Life in Poland, Czech Republic, um, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, North Macedonia, and Albania. And those are the countries in blue on that map. The red countries are where there's interest that we might start in the future. And so it's been great to see how God has been moving one step at a time over these 20 years uh, and opening up doors for young people to hear about Jesus. One of the things that we really get to do right now is to invest into national leaders in each of these countries. And so we get to uh, develop them, encourage them, help them grow in their walk as they reach out to recruit volunteers and also to share about Jesus with teenagers This summer we had over 1,200 kids at camp. This is just one of the camps, videos that we just showed. 
But in all these countries, there's about 1,200 kids going to camp. So it's been great that these, those kids got to hear about Jesus this yeah, summer. Yeah. This is our staff. We have 30 national staff, five Americans, and 18 university students that are part-time staff that we get to lead uh, and walk beside. So we're so excited as we get to help develop them. That's awesome. One, one of the things that happened that yeah. we weren't expecting, actually, uh, 18 months ago is a war started in Ukraine and Russia. And lots of refugees started um, flooding the countries that we're in. And Tom got a hold of me and said, hey, how can CA help? CA gave a generous gift. And the video you saw was our Ukrainian refugee camp this summer. And most of those kids uh, have parents or grandparents that are struggling in the war. And so Stacy's going to tell more about that. Yeah, so real quick before you do, some of you will remember when we gave, that, that money came from what we give together. Uh, those of you that give to Christian Assembly, um, we gave $50,000 to help support their ministry, specifically to the youth of Ukraine who were displaced by the war. And so that's part of what they are doing with that uh, money. Yeah. So thank you for that, because we've now started ministry in six different cities in our countries that we're working in directly with Ukrainian students in Ukrainian language. And so those are the kids that got to come to this camp. You see the picture of about 100 kids who came at that camp. 27 of them made first-time decisions for Jesus. And so wow. we're so thankful for that opportunity. So thank you. Um, so now we're working to plug those kids in with, they have leaders who came from the cities that they now live in. There's Ukrainian churches in each of those cities. So we're working to plug those kids into the churches there um, and just disciple them and follow up with them. So each of our leaders, whether it's the Ukrainian leaders or whether it's the Czech, Polish, um, Albanian leaders, they each reach out to kids to share the good news of Jesus. And so there's hundreds of stories, but we're gonna share just one really quick story with you. Um, the next picture is of right in the middle of the screen. There's a girl, Leona. She's kind of in the back. She's from the Czech Republic. Like Matt said, it's the most atheist country in Europe. And she came to a Young Life Club when she was 15 because she got ex invited. It was going to be fun. And for the first time in her life, somebody told her about God. She'd never heard anything before. And over the years, she accepted Jesus. Uh, she got to know more. She accepted Jesus. And then the pandemic hit. Um, but her leader, who's also the young woman in the picture there, followed up with her, did Zoom Bible studies with her, continued to pursue her. And so now she is one of our um, university student leaders. She's connected with the church. She's serving kids and reaching out. So thank you, CA, to your generosity for helping make all of these ministries possible. Awesome. awesome. Thank you guys so much. I can take this from you. Um, we're just... We're so glad to be part of the work of God through you guys in Eastern Europe. So glad to be partnered with you. Thankful for the work you're doing. I can remember early, early on, it was exciting when one student came to know Jesus. And now to see the ministry spread into seven nations, incredible. Uh, I'd like to just call us all to pray for them um, tonight. And uh, in just a moment, the ushers will come for the uh, kingdom offering. Once a month, we take a second offering uh, that goes to support ministries like Alan Stacy's work in Eastern Europe. And we'll do that in just a moment. But let's pray for them. Would you join me? God, I thank you for these two individuals, for your love for them, for your grace in their lives. God, we do pray your kingdom come. Your will be done in their lives, in their home, in their family, God. Would you sustain them, strengthen them, bless them, bless their children, God. I pray, Lord, for more and more of your favor in the different networks that they work with in all of those different nations. God, that they would find one open door after another for the message of your grace and truth to continue to spread and to change lives. God, we pray for Eastern Europe. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in that place, Lord. I pray that the name of Jesus would be lifted up more and more and more and that the hope 
the hope that is found through Christ would be the reality that more and more of the youth of that nation are living in. God, I pray for your Holy Spirit to do what only you can do in that part of the world. We trust you to do it. We look for you to do it. And we trust you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being here with us. And one last announcement here locally, you have the opportunity to join us for the FCA Sports Camp. Uh, that's a way that we reach out to the youth of our neighborhood right here. Um, thank you to those of you who have already signed up to say you'll join us and help us to do that. But we're still looking for a few more uh, that would come out and spend that day with us. You can sign up on our website for that. The ushers are now ready to come and receive our kingdom offering. Feel no obligation for those of you who are visiting. But for those who do give, God bless you as we give together. Well, church, it is great to be with you. Uh, what an honor and a privilege to gather each weekend and, and have time together. If you're a visitor or a guest, want to welcome you as well. My name is Tom, one of the pastors here at Christian Assembly. And church, I just want to tell you how much I love you. I pray for you every day, usually at least twice a day in the morning and then in the evening as well. And uh, I think so many of you can sense God at work in your own life, but also in our life collectively together. In fact, as we launched this series called The Grudge, we had 350 more people joining us each weekend, though not last weekend because of the hurricane, the, hur the hurricane. <laughs> Having lived in the southeast where real hurricanes come, uh, we had 350 people. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> 350 more people, and uh, in fact, we even have people sitting out in the lobby, and if you're out in the lobby right now, I want to add my welcome to you as well, and those of you online as well. And so we've been making the call. I want to continue to call on the way in. Hopefully you got this little card that is an opportunity for you to join us. God's grace compels us as a church to lead spiritually convinced and unconvinced people to complete commitment to Christ. That's people in the Czech Republic and in Eastern Europe. That's people right here in Los Angeles as well. And as God has continued to gather more and more people to our in-person services, uh, as you look around, you see that we're running out of seats. And so we're going to be launching an 1115 North service right across the street. This is the south side. That's the north side of the street. We own buildings over there. There's a venue that seats about 300 people that we are going to be launching a service. And we need about 300 people from these south side services to go to that side of the street. Alan Stacy moved across the world and learned a different language <laughs> to follow Jesus. You might not be called to move across the world, but you are being called to move across the street. I'll, I'll tell you that right now. And uh, for those of you who are parents of middle schoolers, of course, we want you to be at this service because our middle school ministry is running across the street. By the way, um, between our middle school and high school ministry, Saturday night, Wednesday, we launched. We had 298 students who gathered at those launches. Amazing to see God at work through our students. But if you are not a parent of a middle schooler um, and you have some flexibility in your schedule, we're inviting and, and calling you to join us on Sunday morning across the street. That will help in a couple ways. One, that'll give us the critical mass to launch that service well. But also, ideally what we would like is we'd like all the services to have some open seats so that when you invite a friend, you're not having to sit in the lobby. Does that make sense? So that's kind of what we're going for. And um, really, we need you to be part of that and invite you and call you to be part of that. And so even right now, I want you to go ahead and grab this. Some of you are thinking, oh, somebody else will respond. They might not. You might be the person that God is saying, hey, I want you to be part of that new endeavor. And so let's pray. God, we pray. And really, we thank you. This is a great challenge for us as a congregation to have. It's one that we prayed that we would have, that more and more people would gather in person. But Lord, as, the, as you do that, as you gather more and more people, not just to, to a service, but really as you gather more and more people to you. I heard just recently, just today, about three people who came to Christ this morning through Christian Assembly. Lord, we thank you for the fresh work you're doing. And Lord, we do pray for all the services, but including this 1115 North service. 
I ask God that you would stir in our hearts now if we're to be part of that. And if that's you, go ahead, you can write your name and your phone number down, email, and really we're just asking you to make that service your home service. It's gonna be a great time. It's really gonna be a great chance for you to meet other people and get connected. If you feel a little disconnected, it'll be a great way for you to feel connected. Uh, Same teaching, both sides of the street, live worship, both sides of the street. So God, we pray for a strong and healthy launch. And also, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to help us be faithful to continue to extend the gospel right where we are as well. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and fill out that card. You can put it in the buckets as you exit, as we move. I think it's only two more weeks and we'll be launching that service. So we're excited about that. Well, we are in a series that we have entitled The Grudge, and it's always kind of a a privilege to be together, but I I feel a a great sense of anticipation because I keep hearing from so many of you how God is helping you through this series. Week one, we talked about overcoming and letting go and forgiving the small offenses. Last week, we talked about overcoming and forgiving the bigger offenses. If you missed last week because it was raining and all the rest, you can uh, catch that online at cachurch.com. This week, we're jumping into what does it look like whenever we feel disappointed in life, when we feel disappointed even with God. Let me ask and start with a question. How many of you love a good miracle story, right? Pop your hand up, right? I mean, who doesn't love that? You enjoy it when God shows up, shows off, and he does something powerful. Maybe somebody you know, they made the commitment to give 10% back to God, and they started tithing on Sunday, and they walked into work on Monday, and they got a promotion and a raise, and you celebrate with them. But maybe you're also thinking, I started tithing a year ago, and I ain't getting no promotion, and I ain't getting a raise. Like, God, where's my miracle? Or you have a friend who is praying for a physical healing, and, and God shows up, and they're healed. I heard a story this week from one of our kingdom partners in a different part of the world, and a miraculous story of healing, and, and they got healed, and they got their miracle. But you were praying for healing, maybe for you, or maybe you're praying for a loved one, and they weren't healed. Or maybe, maybe you have a, a good friend, you have a, a, a good girlfriend, and, and she broke up with her not-so-good boyfriend. By faith, she took a, took a risk, kind of like, God, I know this relationship's not good for me. I'm going to trust you. She broke it off. And then a week later, God brought into her life this amazing guy who looks like the son of Brad Pitt. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he's memorized the entire New Testament. And three weeks later, he proposes. And they win a free honeymoon and it's all on Instagram reels for you to see like every time you're on social media. And, and then maybe you felt inspired by that. And so you did the same thing by faith. You broke up with your not so good boyfriend in 2015. You did that. <laughs> and the only date you've had since then is with Ben and Jerry. And that's not, that's not been so good. And you're wondering, God, where are you in my life? Where's my miracle? Let me ask you, what do you do when you feel disappointed with God? You feel let down. The business you thought God wanted you to build is now struggling. Maybe even it went bankrupt. What do you do? You maybe don't even want to say it out loud. So I'm saying it out loud for you because of your reverence to, to God. But you're wondering, God, where are you? Why aren't you showing up for me, God? And maybe in the quiet moments before you go to sleep at night, you're laying there, you put your head on the pillow and you, you sense like that you feel slightly or maybe even more than slightly disappointed with God, angry with God. What do you do if you realize you're holding a grudge against God? We're gonna consider that, but before we do, let's pray. So God, we thank you how you're at work all around the world But God, you want to be at work in our life right now. We gather not just to hear a message from me, we gather to hear a word from you. So Lord, whether we're online, whether we're in the lobby, whether we're in the upper room, whether we're in this lower room, I ask that you would help us to set aside all distractions. Lord, whether we consider ourselves spiritually unconvinced or whether we consider ourselves completely committed to you, I ask God that you would speak to us. Lord, this is a tender topic. And I ask God your tenderness would accompany your word as you invite and heal and call us to bring our disappointments from life or even questions we have for you, about you, to bring those to you. 
We ask, God, that you would speak now. I pray you would speak now to all of us, including me. In Jesus' name, amen. On your way in, hopefully you got a bulletin. If you did, you can flip it open to the center section. You'll see that we have uh, the scriptures that are there, as well as the teaching notes that you can fill out as we go throughout our time together this weekend. This series, The Grudge, that we've been in, it's about the fact that we have a tendency as people to hold on to painful things. And part of that's normal, right? I mean, it something bad happens and it's not just easy to just forgive like that. It's not easy to necessarily just let it go. And in fact, I would say, and we'll talk more about this next weekend, but for some, really the process of letting go of painful things, it might require a a, a process of of counseling with godly Christian or pastoral counseling. Uh, there, There could be a process to it. But this week we're going to talk about dealing with our disappointments with God. Now, technically, Biblically, we never forgive God because God never sins. And yet I would say for many of us, maybe even if I would be so bold to say for all of us, certainly including me, there are times when we have to wrestle with our own disappointments, our own confusion, our own pain when we feel like God has let us down. And we're going to look at a story from 1 Samuel. Along the way, I'm going to pull out seven, seven, not three, seven (laughs) key points that are going to help us deal with with our own times of disappointment with God. Let me set the scene. The story opens with a man named Elkanah, Elkanah, and he has two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. And Hannah was the first wife, but she couldn't conceive a child, which is why most biblical scholars believe that Elkanah took a second wife. Hannah couldn't bear children. She's certainly hurt, sad, confused, and disappointed with God. And that's where we pick up the first point that I want you to hear, which is this, is that seasons of disappointment with God are often part of the journey of faith. Now, I know that's not a very inspiring point, right? But the reality is, is that we don't see all that God sees, and we don't know all that God knows. We are finite. We are limited. And our finiteness, our limitedness, means that there will be things that God does or doesn't do that we simply cannot understand. And when that happens, we get disappointed with God. So I would say that in large part, not only, but in large part, the reason that we have disappointment with God as part of our journey of faith has more to do with our limitations than God's goodness or his power. One of the things I love about the Bible is that it's not sanitized. It's not cleaned up. It's filled with people who are are full of faith and they, they love God. They're celebrating God's faithfulness. But it's also filled with people, oftentimes the very same people who were just celebrating God and shouting and worshiping about his goodness, who in a different season feel confused or disappointed or afraid or angry or sometimes even bitter towards God. Now, if I were God's PR man which I'm not, part of me would say, hey, God, listen, I don't know that you would want to include so many stories in the Bible of people wrestling with their disappointment, confusion with you. I mean, that's not the strongest selling point to the life of faith, right? Like, hey, come do this. You're going to be disappointed too some of the time. Like, that's not always very compelling, right? And yet, that's what we see throughout the scriptures. It's not just Hannah. It's Job, it's Miriam, it's Moses, it's Aaron, it's David, it's Jeremiah, it's John the Baptist, it's all the people who loved Jesus and watched him die on the cross. It's Paul who prayed about the thorn in his flesh three times and it wasn't removed. It's Timothy who had a health issue with his stomach and the list could go on. Listen to the psalm written by David, Psalm 13, verse one. He writes, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day, having sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? And that might be where you are right now. Or maybe you're not there, but someone you love and know is. They're they're in their, how long, O Lord, season? God, did you forget about me? They're asking. When I've been in seasons of disappointment with God, it's helped me to know that I'm not alone in it. That other faithful people, and even I would say giants of the faith, have had similar feelings and similar questions in similar circumstances. Why? Because when we feel disappointed with God or confused, we have questions. We can think like this. Well, I must be the only one. I must be doing this whole faith thing wrong 
maybe there's something wrong with me. I've even had people say to me, well, you know, I, I want to follow Jesus, but I, and I believe in the resurrection. I believe, you know, all the core teaching of it, but I still have some questions for God. And so can I follow God if I still have some questions for him? And my answer is absolutely yes. In fact, I would say, if you say, I have no questions for God and I understand everything about how all of life works out, I would say, just live a little bit longer and then, and then you'll have questions as life progresses, right? That, that's the reality that we face. We can think, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. And yet God's word comes to meet us and say, actually, this is a really regular part of a journey with God. And yet, if you're in that season of confusion, disappointment, wondering how long, Lord, just remember that all the giants of the faith in the Bible had also been there too. In fact, I'm glad that I'm not God's public relations person because knowing that so many stories of disappointment and people wrestling with confusion and questions and disappointment help me wrestle in my own times of disappointment with God in seasons when things didn't work out the way that I thought they would or even that I thought they should, where God didn't show up and show off in that instance, why the miracle didn't happen for me in that set of circumstances. And if you're in that season, I just want you to hear that you're not alone. And I hope in some way it helps you to know that you're not alone. Hannah's story continues in verse 3 of 1 Samuel 1. It says, Each year Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heaven's armies at the tabernacle. The priests of the Lord at the time were the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. And on the days Elkanah presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Peninnah and to each of her children. But to Hannah he would give a double portion because he loved her and because the Lord had given her no children. Peninnah would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Peninnah would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. Boy, Peninnah sounds like a real winner of a person, right? <laughs> I mean, she's meaner than a cat in a shower. Like, you would not want to be hanging out with her. And you can only imagine Hannah's mindset, right? I mean, she's got to be thinking, why in the world, God, would you bless her with kids and not me? And verse 7 is painful to me. Year after year, it was the same. Some of you, you might relate to that. Tom, I've been praying, but it seems like year after year, it just, it just seems like it's the same. And Hannah knows what that's like. The story continues. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Now, guys, let me just help you out here, okay? <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's what the answer is. Now, we get... From what we can tell, Elkanah was an overall good guy, but apparently he was not the sharpest tool in the shed. And he, he meant it to be helpful. He meant it to be comforting, but it wasn't helpful and it wasn't comforting. How many of you have ever had a moment where you wanted to comfort someone and then you said something and then you could tell by the look on their face, it was not comforting, it was not helpful, and you have your foot in your mouth and you're like, I, I don't even know what to do. I, I've had that happen. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah. Brings us to the second point, which is this. Be very wise with your words to those who are dealing with disappointment with God. You don't have to be God's PR person. You don't have to fill in the blanks to their questions with answers that, by the way, you don't really know. And often when we try to do that, we, we end up making things worse. If you know someone who's in a deep season of disappointment, we can sometimes stumble into saying stupid stuff, even though we meant to be helpful, right? So what do you do if, you, if you've said something dumb? Here, here's what I've learned. I have a lot of practice at this. And so I've learned to just say, you know what, I'm sorry. I didn't know what to say, and I said the wrong thing. Forgive me. And I tell you, if you have to say, you know what, I'm sorry, I didn't know what to say, and I said the wrong thing, if you have to apologize enough in life, you eventually start to become very careful with what you say when people are in grief and disappointment. So how do we protect those that we love 
from us saying something dumb when they're hurting or confused or dealing with disappointment. This is what I've learned to say to people. And I, as a pastor, as you might imagine, whatever tragedy you can think of, I've been there with people while they're facing that tragedy, that disappointment, that question. And here's what I've learned to say. When I come to them, I say, I don't know what to say to you. But what I do know is that I love you and I'm here for you. Is there anything I can do to help you or serve you in this time? That's what I say. I say that to every single person I don't know what to say. That's what I say to them. If you don't know what to say, then don't say anything at all and just be with them. Sometimes people will say to me, I have a friend and they had this great tragedy happen and I'm so afraid of saying the wrong thing that I don't even want to go be with them. And I want to encourage you, church, to to not give in to that temptation. It is perfectly fine, and most people will love you for it, if you just show up and say, I don't even know what to say. I'm not coming to provide answers. I'm coming just to be with you. And most people aren't going to say, what? You didn't have answers for me? What kind of friend are you? No, they're going to say, thank you. So lean in and be with people, but be very judicious with your words. One of the ways that God helps us through deep grief and disappointment is simply by a trusted friend coming to be with us, even if they don't have all the answers for us. The story continues in 1 Samuel 1 verse 9. Once they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. Brings me a third thing, which is this. Let your disappointments drive you towards God, not away from him. Be like Hannah. That's what Hannah did. She brought all of her deep anguish to God in prayer. She didn't sugarcoat it. She didn't pretend like she wasn't in anguish. She didn't make herself kind of put a plastic smile on her face and pretend like it was all great. In her deep anguish, we read, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. She brought all that deep anguish to God in prayer. And we don't know all of what she said, but it's not recorded. But I guess it would be something like this. God, it isn't fair. I've done all I could for you. I believed in you. I've been faithful. I've loved you. I've trusted you. I've declared your faithfulness. I've declared your goodness. Where are you, God? I'm hurt, angry, and bitter. Why did you let this happen? And I'd guess that that's what her prayers sound like because that's what my prayers sound like and my seasons of disappointment with God. If you know me, you know that I would say often that Alice and I have three children, but the reality is is that we have four, but one of them died in the womb. And that child would have been born between my daughter Sophia, who's a senior in high school, and my son Micah, who is uh, in eighth grade. And we had a miscarriage. And so initially, the baby seemed to be doing fine. The initial sonogram was fine, but then follow-up sonograms weren't so fine. And I remember when we went to Kaiser for one of the follow-up sonograms, and Allison had had some, some signs that she might be having a miscarriage. And, and so we did the sonogram at Kaiser down at sunset, and, and it was confirmed that Allison was indeed in the process of having a miscarriage. I stood on the corner of Sunset Boulevard and Edgemont down in Hollywood. I'm waiting for the crosswalk to change so that Alice and I could go to our, our car and, and go home. And a friend knew what we were going through, and so she called to hear what the news was. They were praying for us, praying for our baby. And, and I answered the phone, and I tried to speak, and I couldn't get the words out. Allison took the phone and she just said, we're losing our baby. And our third child, the one between Sophia and Micah, went to be with the Lord. Over the coming days and weeks and months and and even years, I had to make an intentional choice to not let my pain drive me away from God, but to force it to drive me towards him. And if I'm honest, if I look back at that season... I would say the deepest sign of genuine faith that my wife and I have is not any sermon I've ever preached. It's not any person I've ever led to Christ or any ministry we've ever launched. It's the fact that we chose 
that God was worth it to bring our confusion, our pain, our disappointment, our questions to God. It was the intentional, often hard decision to turn to God with my disappointment about God. God, I'm disappointed in you. Listen, God loves you, and he understands your pain. God can even understand why you can't understand what he's doing or not doing in your life and why he's doing it or not doing it in your life. The Bible makes it clear that that God welcomes your questions and that he's big enough to handle your doubts and even your anguish and your frustration, even your anger. God is big enough to take your pain. Take your pain to God. I believe that God would rather have you yell at him in disappointment and pain than walk away in hurt and defeat. Hannah brings her deep anguish to God. In fact, later she says, I've been praying here out of all my great anguish and grief. I've been pouring out my soul to the Lord, she says. See, she uses all of that as fuel to go deeper with God, not to turn away from him. She ends the prayer by saying in verse 11, and she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. Now, a priest sees her praying. They end up having a conversation. But at the end of the conversation, the priest says to her, may God grant you your request. That's all he says. There's no immediate change. There's no And then the heavens opened up and a light shined down on her. She still walks away with nothing tangible. She still has to deal with Penina. Her husband is still going to say stupid things, you know, in the midst of her pain. She's still got no baby. She's got no real sign. And then what does she do? This is the fourth thing. Is she keeps showing up in worship. In fact, the very next verse in 1 Samuel 119 says... The entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship the Lord once more. For some of you, and I I would say I've experienced this for me as well, sometimes your greatest act of faith is showing up in worship when you don't feel like it. That's what she does. She hangs on. She shows up. She still doesn't understand, and all of her questions haven't been answered. We grow spiritually in either a quest or a crisis. That's when we grow. When we keep showing up, even before our circumstances change, it's a form of worship. Our actions are saying, God, I don't understand you. I'm hurt, I'm angry, I'm disappointed, but you are worthy for me to bring you my questions, my hurts, and my disappointments. In fact, I would say that appearances can be deceiving in worship. You could come into a a, a worship time. There could be somebody jumping up and down and shouting and whistling. And you'd be like, man, that person's so full of faith. There could be somebody sitting next to them, just kind of bowed with their head, kind of bowed low. And you could think like, what's up with that dud? Why aren't they kind of up jumping around? And actually it could be the person who's seated, who's going through deep disappointment but shows up, is bringing their disappointment to God. They might actually be exhibiting the more powerful faith because of what they're going through. And yet they keep showing up in worship. If you want your faith to grow, it's like, God, I'm gonna gonna keep showing up even when I don't understand it all. I'm gonna trust that you're good even when I don't understand. Now in Hannah's case, the story ends like this. It says, then they returned home to Ramah and Elkanah slept with Hannah. The Lord remembered her plea and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel for she said, I asked the Lord for him. Brings me to the fifth point, which is this, that in time, we may see that God's delay is not God's denial. Sometimes with seasons of disappointment with God, they can look completely different in hindsight when more of the story unfolds. In fact, not only did the Lord give her Samuel, but then in time also gave her three more sons and two daughters for a total of of six children. But what if that's not the case? What if our disappointment isn't resolved in our time on earth? That would bring me to the sixth point, which is this, that we have to remember that this life is not the end of our story. Jesus promises in John 16, 33, he says, I've told you all of this so that you might have peace in me. Here on earth, you have many trials and sorrows. 
but take heart because I have overcome the world. Jesus makes it clear that we're going to have sorrows, pains, trials, disappointments on earth, but he encourages us to take heart. Why? Because he's overcome the world. And how did he do that? By his death and his resurrection. And so he shows us that our disappointment in this life is not the end of the story. In fact, Revelation 21.1 says it this way, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared. And I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. And here it is, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All of these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. Am I disappointed and sad that Alice and I experienced a miscarriage? Yes, I am. Do I have questions for God about it? Yes, I do. Do I want you to answer my questions? No, I don't. So don't come up here afterwards and be like, you know, have you ever considered the fact that I already have? Don't worry. I've considered it. But I can also tell you that when I get to meet our child and spend forever with him on the new earth, that I'm fully trusting that my disappointment, my sorrow, my pain will all be undone. Our life is but a breath. It's fleeting. When you're young, it doesn't feel like it's fleeting. The older you get, the more certain you are that it's fleeting. (laughs) The pain will all be undone. And that's good news. But what about the meantime? Am I just left to wallow in my pain, my bitterness, my sorrow? No. And this brings me to our final point. We can have peace now that transcends our understanding. When we're dealing with our disappointment with God, we can be prone to ask the question, why? Why? That's the question everybody asks me in the midst of great sorrow, tragedy, suffering, disappointment. Why, Tom? Why did this happen? Or why didn't the thing happen that I wanted and prayed for it to happen? God, why didn't you intervene? Why? And often we don't get answers to those questions. I don't know why Allison and I had a miscarriage. And I don't know why God didn't choose to answer our prayers for a miracle in that situation. And if you have some disappointment with God, you probably have some why questions that have rattled around in your brain and soul as well. And if you're like me, you can be tempted to think, God, if you would just tell me why, then I could be at peace. Because we think the way to peace is through our rational mind. If I can just understand it all, then I would be at peace. But there are some things that we will never be able to understand. And yet God doesn't leave us without peace, even though we can't understand it. God never promises us that our peace will come through understanding. We're often tempted to think that way. If all my questions were answered, then I'd be at peace. Instead, God offers us a different way towards peace, one that surpasses our understanding. Here it is in Philippians 4, verses 5 and 7. The Lord is near. I want you to hear that, church. The Lord is near. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He doesn't snuff out a smoldering a reed or a broken reed. He is near. His compassion is steadfast, and his love for you is forever, even when you don't understand what he's doing, even when you don't understand why he didn't answer the prayer that you prayed so desperately. The Lord is near. It goes on and says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, even the ones you might feel disappointed about, But in every situation, by prayer and petition, that's requests, with thanksgiving. You know, I'm not thanking God that my wife had a miscarriage. I'm thanking God for other things. So by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, you present your requests to God. And here it is. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, which means that you can experience something that you won't be able to explain, will guard your heart and your mind your emotions, and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. In dealing with my own disappointment with God from our miscarriage, I never really got an answer to why. And the passage of time hasn't made it any clearer. And somewhere along the way in my prayers, my prayers about that disappointment changed. Initially, it was like, why, God, why? And instead of asking God, why, 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 Because in asking him why, 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 I was asking him to deliver on a promise that he never made to me. 
He never said to me, Tom, you're going to understand everything I always do. He never said that. He never said, I'll always give you an answer to whenever you ask me why. But my prayers changed because really what I wanted was peace, peace for me and for my wife. And so I said, okay, God, I'm shifting my prayers. I'm aligning them with your word. Now you're on the hook. You don't promise me that my peace is going to come from my questions being answered. But you do promise me that there's a peace that transcends my, under, uh, my ability to understand, that you can guard my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. So I did what God's word said, that what we just read. I trusted that God was near, even though he felt like he was a million miles away. I put more faith in God's word than I did my feelings. Look, if you let your feelings lead you, if you're just like, I'm just going to do whatever my feelings tell me to do, your life's going to be a train wreck constantly. Somebody cut me off in traffic. I'm mad at them. I'm going to rear end them because my feelings told me to do that. Your insurance company is going to be like, great, now you owe us a million dollars, like forever. I mean, you just can't live life being controlled by your feelings all the time. I'm mad at somebody. I'm going to let them have it. Well, then that's going to damage the... You just can't do that. So God, really what I want is peace. And I trusted you, Lord, that you're near, even though you felt like a million miles away. And I did my best to not be anxious. I prayed that I wouldn't be anxious. I thank God for his many blessings. Sometimes you can be deeply disappointed with God in one area, but still see his goodness and blessing in another area of your life. And then I prayed and I asked God that he would give me peace and my wife peace. The one that he promises that is available to me right now. The one that's available to you right now. The one that comes not through all of our questions being answered, but that comes only within the framework and in the context of the gift of prayer. The one that can guard my heart, my emotions, as well as my mind in Christ Jesus. And I can tell you when I shifted my prayers that slowly but surely, one prayer at a time, God answered that prayer. Do I have answers about why everything happened the way it did? No, I don't. But what I do have, and you can have as well, because God promises that you can have it. It's a peace that will transcend your understanding. It'll, it'll guard your heart and guard your mind now as you wait the coming promise of the new heaven and the new earth made possible by Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. A new earth where there will be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow, and no more disappointment. God has a grace for you now, and he has a grace for you in the future as well. Let's pray. If you're in a season of waiting, remember, I want you to hear that God's delay is not God's denial. Remember and trust that God is good. God's character doesn't change even if you can't make sense and I can't always make sense of our circumstances. And so bring your requests to God. God, I'm still in a season of waiting on this. This is, I'm thanking you for all the things you've done. And this is my prayer request. I'm, I'm bringing this to you again. Others of you, whether you're online or in person, you're not in a season of waiting. You're disappointed with God because the outcome has already happened and you can't understand it. And I've been there too. And I just want to invite you to do what God's word says, to pray to him now about it. Do what Hannah did. She brought her anguish and and her pain to him. He loves you. He can handle your feelings. You don't have to protect God from your feelings. Ask him to give you a peace that surpasses understanding. You might just need to tell him, God, I need your help to not hold a grudge against you. What I wanted you to do, you didn't do. And I don't understand why. But I'm asking for your help now to choose to let that go. Though you didn't answer my prayer in the way that I wanted you to, God, I still now am choosing to trust in you. Not because of what I see, God, but because of who you are. Maybe for some of us, sometimes we can get disappointed with God because of what people have chosen to do. Not necessarily what God did or didn't do. Let me ask you, where do you need to separate what a person did or didn't do versus what God did or didn't do? I don't want to be held responsible for what someone else has done. 
It's not fair for me to hold God responsible for what some other person has done in their free will. Where do you need to separate and disentangle? Maybe your disappointment isn't even with God. Maybe your disappointment is with some people that you need to forgive or, or you need to ask God to help you let go of the hurt. Others of you, and I know this, if it doesn't apply to you now, it will at some point in your life. Maybe you've got a friend who's disappointed with God. And if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, I want to encourage you in those moments when your friend is disappointed with God, don't back up from them because you're afraid you might say the wrong thing. Step forward and lean in. And just say, I love you, I'm here for you. What can I do to serve you? They don't need answers from you that you don't have to give them. What they need in times of great grief is they need someone's presence to be with them that they trust. And so God, we pray now as we bring any disappointment, any pain, any hurt, any confusion, question, we bring it to you and we ask God that you would give us a peace that surpasses understanding, that that would guard our heart and guard our mind in Christ Jesus. And Lord, not only would would you do that for us, but Lord, would you use us as agents for others that we might encounter who, who've got some unaddressed grief or disappointment, that you would use us to be a loving presence in their life, to just say, I love you, I'm here. What can I do to serve you and to pray for you? God, help us to experience that peace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.